I take it pers personally that it's all women this morning. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm happy yes. with that. I... But, I mean, it's about women artists. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. What yeah. does that say? Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of, has anybody heard of Linda Nocklin before? No. No, no I haven't no. either. Um, she, an art historian who came from a very, a long line of very feisty women. Um, and she, she was asked, I think it was in 1970, or there was... Uh, by a new a New York gallerist called Richard Feingen. He, he was asking why there are no great women artists. He said he would love to show women artists a problem and he couldn't find any good enough. So she considered to went on to look at this issue and, and wrote a, an article, an essay, uh, which appropriated his 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 question. And I think her conclusions are really quite interesting. That's a, that's actually a um, a picture of her that will come across a similar one of her late, later on in the, but that's her then. I don't know when she, she is from. Now, um, at the age of six, she was very precocious, Linda. She gouged out Tinkerbell's eyes in an illustrated edition of Peter Pan. As she said, my first act of proto-feminist critique in the realm of the visual. <laughs> Referring to it as a desecration, she said, I hoped it hurt and I was both frightened and triumphant looking at the black holes in the expensive paper. I hated Tinkerbell. Her weakness, her sickening sweetness, helplessness, wispy, effervescent body. So different from my sturdy, plump one. Her pale hair, her pleater with the audience to approve of her. I was glad I had destroyed her baby blue, baby blue eyes. Freudian, she added, could make of this what they will. <laughs> But, and of course, it became she became Tinkerbell became very famous when she was a, a central part of the um, Disney cartoon, the the one on the right. And these are some of the earlier drawings for that. And there's there's actually a an article about the evolution of Tinkerbell. And I know, and as you pointed out yesterday, Jackie, when I mentioned this, Tinkerbell wasn't lacking feistiness. She she apparently had a very bad bad anger problem. <laughs> oh, she's. They possess of a Peter Pan. That, that's right, yes. Her man, yes. Anyway, so why why is it this? I'm going to put this down, you down to the bottom of here now. Right. Um, and the, the, the thing about it is that she was saying that greatness is bestowed by those in power. There was a lack of access to professional training. Women were expected to, to focus on the so-called minor genres of portraiture, landscape, and still life. So she rejected that there, are, that there existed these de facto feminine artistic styles. Changes need to place, take place structurally and to be organized collectively. It was only in the late 19th century that lady students were admitted to life drawing classes by the Royal Academy. And even then the models had to be partially closed. Closed, closed, clothed. <laughs> <laughs> So they either had to be extraordinarily inventive or turn their attention away from history painting towards the minor genres that are mentioned there. Um, well, dis disadvantage may be, may be an excuse, but it's not everything, she said. It's, uh, it's not an intellectual position to take. Um, she, uh, well, what, what she went on to, to do, um, the, the, the person we're talking about, is that she, she, ra she ran one of the first courses on the image of women in the 19th, 20th century. Um, there was no such thing as feminist art history, no reading list on which she could draw. So her, her seminar topics included women as angel and devil, representations of the new through history, pornography, the theme of the prostitutes, the holy family and the joys of domesticity, Freudian myth mythology and modern art and women as artists. And she had to invent all those from scratch. You have to fill in those titles. Her other artists in, uh, interests included Oriel Orientalism, Jewish identity, aging, class, work, and motherhood. Um, on, she did an, an essay on Morisot's The Wet Nurse and Julie, 1879, which as you can see there, and she weaves those together to, to great effect. So... Was she French, I presume? There you um, go. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your question answered. Yes, Berthe Marine Pauline Morisot, uh, died in 1895, a French and Impressionist painter married to 
Eugene Manet, the brother of Edouard Manet. So um, she, she came from, from quite a line of, uh, of impressionists. And this is one of a, a portrait of her with a bouquet of violets in mourning for Lovely. her father. Uh, it's Lovely. 1872, Musée d'Orsay. There's another one, Jour de, uh, Jour d'été, Summer's Day, 1879. <laughs> but coming back to this one, I went, we first started off with this one. And she, she called it a, um, a clear eyed representation of gendered labor. It's extraordinary, she argues, because the chief subject is not as first appears, it's not as it appears an intimate scene of a mother and child. Do you know what it is? It's the wet nurse. The wet nurse. Yeah. The wet, yes, the yeah, the clue's in the title, isn't it? It's a wet nurse. <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's a rep it, for her, it's a clear-eyed representation of gendered labour filtered through Morisot's dazzlingly unfettered construction. Morisot is the mother of the infant in the painting, who is being nursed by another wo woman, the artist's model, not for love, but for money. As Nochlin said, all that is solid melts into air. Impressionist artists painted the environments to which they had access. In an essay published the same year, Griselda Pollock pointed out that for the bourgeois women, this meant paint gar painting gardens and drawing rooms. So it was, a, it was definitely a challenging topic to, to, to choose. So, um, in 2019, the National Museum of Women and the Arts in Washington, D.C. reported that 80% of the artists represented in U.S. museums were men. I'm, I'm surprised that the proportion of women was as high as that, actually, that's the 13%. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was, it was only 19% <coughs> in the uh, 1970s. There hadn't been that much of a change. Um, her other interest was Orientalism, and this is a very famous painting. I've never seen it before. Have any of you? Yeah. Leon Jerome's Snake Charmer, 1879. And um, she wrote an article about this, the imaginary Orient, uh, in response to a lot of the apolitical exhibitions about the Orient and just the, you know, the, the glorying in the, 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 the painting itself. And she's called this a document of 19th century colonialist ideology. Snake Charmer does not invite the viewer to identify with members of the depicted audience so much to, us, to cast them as voyeurs free to enjoy the spectacle from the sidelines. The naked boy's rosy buttocks and his semi-clad semi observers are presented at a remove as objects of picturesque delicata delictation. I think you can see what she's getting at, can't you, really? Um, and it's it, it just that she's, you know, she was one of the first to, to point out some of the, in, the anachronisms of it. Though they don't look semi-naked to me, they're observers particularly there. There you go. No. <laughs> very fully clothed, actually. Yes. Um, this is uh, Manet's Bar at the Folie Berger. And she, she contrasts that, the one we've just seen, to, this, um, to Manet's this painting by Manet, painted three years later, in which the barmaid confronts her viewers directly. After Said Nocklin argues that the time that time stands still in this Orientalist fantasy, a world untouched by historical progress. So she was trying to point out that women's represent that the sort of representation that was going on in French Impressionist work was not the same as the Orientalists' neo-colonial view, colonial viewpoint. Whether you accept that or not, it's an interesting view to take. I I love this painting. I think it's terrific. I've seen it before, and I never knew it was that it was um, um, Linda Lachlan. That's her daughter, Daisy, by Alice Neal. What nationality was Linda Lachlan? American. She came from a, as I say, her, her grandmother was um, 
uh, a deep sea fisher person. <laughs> she had a very strong feminist uh, mother and grandmother. Um, and, and that original photograph you showed us of her, <coughs> she didn't look black. This woman. No, no, she's not black. No, no, she's white. She's white. Yeah. Mm. This, this but, has a, uh, another field. The she, daughter's uh, very uh, blonde. <laughs> Very you know, ginger, I would say, on my screen. I don't know. Well, yes, they're they're yes. both redheads, aren't they? I think they could be, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, she it's knuckling the skin reflects. Skin tone, on... I'm thinking of. Yeah. I'm yeah. wondering if your computer screen is because she looks very white to me. So mm. I think one of the things. Well, the is daughter when... looks very white, but not yeah. the mother. When you, when you look at um, images, if you look for an image uh, online at Google, you'll find each image image looks very very different because they're yeah, different, they do, different they? color choices and lighting and so forth mm, so it yeah, very it's, much it's depends on your computer we are kind of stuck with that a bit yeah anyway she she reflected on this um um uh, when she re th this painting of her by neil neil who was famous for needling her subjects as well as cajoling them out of their clothes <laughs> told the told the fully clothed knocklin you don't seem so anxious, but that's how you come out. Yes, yeah, she looks very tense. <laughs> this was a vital evidence of portraiture's ability to expose the, expose the gap between exterior and interior selves. And she only occasionally adopts a defensive tone. I was keeping a lively four-year-old in place, as you said. That's why she was anxious. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to keep a kid steady when they're being painted, I imagine that was very anxiety-making. I can, mm. I can certainly uh, feel for her on that one. You can see that, can't you? That child's ready to skip her. Yeah, she's got, she's got a hand on her, saying, "Stay there." <laughs> she's not happy. She's yet, yeah. <laughs> Rather she than pose. Very thin as well. Yeah. Yes, it's very I, different from that photograph you showed. She must be much older. Yeah, that was a, a kind of a younger one of her, but it's um, yeah. I, I I really I just really like that painting. I don't know why it just seems to get <coughs> a lot. Anyway, this is Dior's Spring Collection two thousand and eighteen. Um, <laughs> can you see what it says? Why have there been no great women artists? So mm -hmm. then it becomes a um, it becomes a kind of fashion statement. It become it, it it's it's like almost every generation of feminists has had to reread and re 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 look at the arguments that um, were put forward by Nocklin and come out with it because the question still is hanging there a bit. There's still problems, less so I think than they used to be. But uh, I mean, the, the art historian uh, Janine Tang has repurposed the title of Nocklin's essay to ask. Why have there been no great transgender artists? Which is a, a, valid, a valid point. Other people have posed, posed the question in relation to the exclusion of people of colour from the established canon of great artists, the overwhelming majority of whom are white. So they, what they show is the long afterlife of the original inquiry, but they're also powerful attempts to redress the historical blind spots not originally but on women but that now on queerness and race so i think that's kind of quite valid really <laughs> so it wasn't a very long one but i thought i just i just follow i'd followed my my own interest in it and having known nothing of her and i, and I end up quite impressed by her she's a she was a, she's a very very feisty woman that yes that first one of her the um the, the the picture we had of her was very different indeed from her. She looks, I don't less angular than in that painting, certainly. Interesting the features of someone who's not well there in that painting. Yeah. She doesn't know. look well in that painting, no. no. <laughs> it's probably just the artist's impression, do you think? You know? Yeah, I think so, I think but so. But don't always paint what they see. Well, let's have a look, see what well, they see. see something hey, different. What they right? feel about what they see. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. Yeah. I, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but you know, there was an article on Woman's Hour about this very issue the other day. Oh, no, oh, I heard it the oh. other day. Uh, they showed people paintings painted by and painted by men. Paint, you know, not not paintings everybody knows, but yeah. And the overwhelming 
<laughs> they asked people, did they like these paintings? And the overwhelming response was to the men's paintings. And this was quite astonishing, you know, to this researcher. But this is what she was talking about. It was only last week. Well, there uh, you go. So I, didn't, I didn't know that was on. It's the thing is, that if you Google women artists of the 19th century and the 20th century, there's dozens and dozens and dozens, and some of their paintings are absolutely yeah. beautiful because they weren't allowed to paint nudes, were they? I mean, that yeah. was part of the problem. And I was also thinking it's the same with um, William Morris's designs. A lot of his designs weren't his. They were his daughter, May, and yet he got credited with them not her you know it's uh i think there must be a lot of that went on i'm sure oh yes did yeah. it go on very much in painting where the woman gave a man's name like they did in novel in writing right. um, yeah, you know, because right. you just didn't yeah. get published so yeah. did you not get um uh exhibitions if you were a female <laughs> Because it's a very patriarchal society, isn't it? So, mm. you know, women couldn't make in as I always think of Dorothy Wordsworth writing quite a bit of Wordsworth's poetry. Yeah. But, uh, or he pinched her ideas. Who, who do you think is the most famous female artist now? Probably Frida Kahlo. Because <laughs> you did a session on her brain. <laughs> yeah, and when I was at, Okay, so... a live one, a live one. Oh, a live one. No idea. Tracy Emmons? Tracy Emmons, pretty much. Up. Tracy Emmons, quite well known, yes. Yeah. I, I never liked her for a long while. Then I heard an interview with her and she came off over it brilliantly. I was really, really impressed by her. So uh, yes. I think it's a bit unfair. <laughs> it's very personal, her paintings, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Very wordy, 